Good morning, Gospel of Grace Church. Um, before we get to our call to worship, I want to welcome everyone and uh, say how good it is to see smiling faces on this Lord's Day, and as well to give a few announcements. Um, the women's study uh, will meet at the end of the month on June 28th to discuss Psalm 46. Please pick up a study guide from the back table. Even if you cannot attend, you can use the study guide um, on your own. Um, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to see Heather Spencer. Um, as well, um, we have two events going on next Saturday, Saturday the 11th. Um, there's a mandatory um, children's ministry training um, from 12 to 3 at the Verona Community Center. Um, lunch will be provided. Um, and as well, that evening, Saturday the 11th, from 6 to 9, um, will be the first of two membership classes. Um, the other membership class will take place two weeks from that day, which will be the 25th. Um, those are mandatory um, for anyone who wishes to become a member. Um, and you don't have to, if you go to the classes, you don't have to become a member. But if you want to become a member, you have to go to the classes. Um, the uh, youth will meet Wednesday from 6 to 8 at the Vogans. Um, and as well, also, for those of you who were at the retreat a few weeks ago, um, the lost and found from that weekend is in the back, um, and is slowly making its way to the thrift store. So make sure to stop by and look and see if anything that is belonging to you is back there. Those are all the announcements I have. So if you would, turn to Psalm 85. We'll read and then pray for our call to worship. O Yahweh, you showed favor to your land. You returned the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your fury. You turned back from your burning anger. Turn us back, O God of our salvation, and cause your vexation towards us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger from generation to generation? Will you not yourself return to revive us, that your people may be glad in you? Show us, O Yahweh, your loving kindness, and give us your salvation. Let us hear what the God Yahweh will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his holy ones. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Loving kindness and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth springs up from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. Indeed, Yahweh will give what is good, and our land will yield its produce. Righteousness will go before him and will establish the way of his steps. Let us pray. O oh, Father in heaven, uh, we remember your faithfulness this morning, your mercy and your grace. As you have forgiven your people in times of old, and so today you forgive your elect day in and day out. Lord, we are so grateful to remember your loving kindness towards us and the loving kindness throughout all ages. We remember, Lord, and we cry out for you to take action, as the psalmist has written. May you turn us back, O God, of our salvation. May you cause your vexation towards us to cease. May you show us your loving kindness, and may you give us our, the salvation which you offer. Lord, through Christ, we see these things. We see your grace, your mercy, and we, re we rejoice to be called to your people. Lord, we also listen and we pray that we would hear as you speak. We look forward this morning to hearing your word preached and sung through the songs and read, even as we have read. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, may you stir in the hearts of all those who are present that we might grow in our love and obedience and dependence, devotion to you. Lord, we remember, we cry out to you, and we listen, for behold, you have spoken. Grant us faith to believe on Christ, your Messiah, 
and believe his word and your word. May you bless your word this morning to us. Amen. Amen. If you're willing, I invite you to stand with me.
Our scripture reading this morning will be in Revelation chapter 6, so follow along as I read. It says, Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hands. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. When the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true? Will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, And the sun became black as sackcloth made with hair, 
and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree cast its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. And the sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of their place. And then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Join with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, this is a, it's a startling passage. Uh, it describes your judgment being poured out on those who have rejected you. And it, it details a time of war and of famine, of death and uh, astrological and environmental chaos that is just absolutely terrifying. This scene proves that you are a just judge. You know, mankind has ignored your glory. It has ignored your, your greatness. It has mocked you and, and said that you do not see their sin. Uh, you will not judge. And even as this judgment unfolds, we, we see that these people are hard-hearted towards you. And they attempt to, to hide rather than to turn to you for forgiveness. And apart from your grace, we would be amongst the hard-hearted crowd. We would be mockers. We would be those who reject your sovereignty and your majesty. And the reality is we deserve your wrath. We deserve your judgment. But you have given us a heart of faith to, to see you for who you are and to, to recognize the depths of our sin and our need for forgiveness. And you have provided that forgiveness through Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for your great mercy upon us. Lord, this judgment is still to come. It is looming. It, it will happen upon those who continue to reject you. And we ask that you would rescue many from it. Please pour out your spirit that, that he would regenerate dead hearts. You know, as we, as, as we think about our, our nation and the world and the state that it's in, we, we see wickedness and, and violence. We see the ugliness of the human heart when it is without you. You know, governments and, and laws are incapable of taming an evil heart. But it's no match for the power of your spirit to replace hatred with love, cruelty with kindness, and arrogance with humility. To turn a hardened sinner into a lover of you. And so while we know that judgment must come on those who reject you as Lord, we, we ask that you would continue to save. And to save many before your great patience is spent and your righteous judgment is poured out. Lord, we are thankful for our church, thankful that you have given us fellowship with like-minded believers where we can come and sing songs that glorify you. We can hear your word faithfully taught, be encouraged and, and loved in the fellowship that we have uh, amongst one another before and after the services and throughout the week. Lord, help us each to, to grow in the, the grace and the knowledge of you and and to, as we grow, to help one another grow. Please preserve the unity within the body. Help us to be humble. Help us to be sensitive to sin and, and quick to repent. Help us to be more like you. And we are thankful for our pastor and, and others who help lead the church. Please protect them and their families from the evil one who desires to tear them down and, and to smear your name. Help them to be faithful. Give them wisdom as they lead. Lord, we, we lift up the other local churches that are meeting this morning. We ask that you would bless them in their time of worship. Help them to be 
faithful as they serve you, and that together we would be a true testimony of your, your greatness and your holiness. We pray for the remainder of the service, that, that you would be glorified in our singing and in the preaching of your word. We ask that you would help our minds to be attentive, that distractions would not rob us from, from hearing the truth, and help our hearts to be sensitive to your spirit as you make the message personal and, and apply it to our situation that we would grow in our righteousness. Also, please prepare our hearts for communion later in the, the service as we remember your sacrifice and, and the promise of your return. And Lord, we, we look forward to that day. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Musicians. And I trust that all of our hearts have already been encouraged, that we have been comforted and calibrated to worship our Lord. 
And my desire is to continue to do so by being obedient to His Word. Well, as a church family, we have been on a journey going verse by verse through Paul's two letters to the Thessalonian church. And today we are going to conclude our journey with the final exhortation that Paul gives to the church. How does Paul conclude his letter to the Thessalonians? Well, he, he exhorts them to pursue purity. If you noticed here in our last stanza, the last verse that we just sang, it talked about the church being a lamp out of gold to be an effective witness in the community. And so Paul is going to exhort the Thessalonian church to pursue purity. Now, what does that mean? Well, please open your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And our text today will be verses 13 through 18. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. 2 Thessalonians is a short letter. It has only three short chapters. But even though it's short, it is filled with rich theology and practical instructions. Chapter 1, we saw the upcoming judgment of God, which He will pour out on the wicked who rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And we read about their eternal destruction in hell. And then in chapter 2, we saw that the day of the Lord will begin with the rapture of the church, and then the revealing of the Antichrist, who will deceive those who remain on the earth. In chapter 3, Paul makes three final exhortations. In each exhortation, it begins with a call to the brethren. In verse 1, we saw Paul addressing the brethren, he says that we need to pray and continue to spread the word. In verse 6, Paul addresses the brethren and he says that there's a problem of idleness. Now in verse 13, Paul again turns to the brethren and he begins to give the church final instructions on how to keep the church healthy. Now, some time ago, there was an article in our Daily Bread about a large tree, a large tree that was located in the city's central park. And people in that community, they knew about this tree. They took pride in it. The tree was gigantic, huge. Some considered it to be the, the park's main attraction. It was just huge. Well, one day after a violent storm, people found that the tree broke off and it was lying across the park's pathway where people used to walk and jog. It broke off and all that remained was the splintered stump. Well, after close examination, it became clear why the tree broke. You know, from the outside, the tree looked to be healthy. However, from the inside, it was completely rottened out. A thousand of these tiny little insects, they destroyed its inside. You see, the cause of the fall was not the actual storm. The cause of the fall began when the first insect nested within the tree's bark. That's when it all began. If we as a church, if we want to be an effective witness in our community, if we want to weather our upcoming storms, then listen, it's important for us to keep our church healthy. Every believer is required to be holy. Every believer is required to be separated from this world. And therefore, it's necessary to define the boundaries in how the church is to be pure. Let's go ahead and read our passage and see what Paul says about keeping the church pure. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good, 
If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person. Do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Yet, do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, and this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And that's how Paul concludes his second letter to the Thessalonians. And in our text, we see that for us to be pure, for us to be a healthy church, we need to observe three things. Duty, discipline, and delight. A church is tasked with a mission. We have a purpose. And therefore, this means we have a duty. All of us have a duty. So let's look at verse 13 again. And notice here that Paul reminds us that we need to be doing good. Why is it important for us to do good? We need to do good because that is God's will for us, His church. You see, the Lord saved us and He did not immediately rapture us. He left us on this earth for a purpose. What's the purpose? To do good works. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, after Paul explained that we are saved by grace through faith, and that's not of ourselves, in verse 10, we are told that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We need to do good works that God prepared for us. That is our duty. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, we see the charge, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do what? Work for His good pleasure. The church is not to be idle. Instead, we need to work. We need to work out our salvation Obeying God's instruction for His good pleasure. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, there Paul says, Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we, an unperishable, imperishable. So we work, we strive, we we practice self-control because of the imperishable, eternal glory and reward that God promised us in eternity. Well, what is this good that we are to do? We are to do good works. What is the good works that Paul is talking about here? Well, it's not what we determine to be good. Each one of us can have our own little definition of what it, what it means to do good works. It's not up to us to determine what is good. Instead, we are to do the good which God calls good. In other words, we are to do what God's Word teaches. You see, God, He instructs Christians in the church to use their gifts to edify others. We are to be the witness of the gospel message. Uh, We are to serve. We are to minister. Uh, we're to sacrifice, we're to worship the Lord, all of those things. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10, talking about how we're to use our gifts to edify one another. He says there, as each, one, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So notice, we are many members Each one of us, though, is gifted. We are all part of Christ's body, but yet we are gifted in a special way and we are to use our gift for the edification of the whole body, of the whole church. And so that means each one of us is to use our gift for Christ and His glory. If you're gifted in preaching and teaching, 
then be diligent to do good. If you're gifted in music and singing, then be diligent and use your gift to do good. If you're gifted in administration, use your gift of administration to do good. If you're gifted in technology and logistics, use your gift to do good. If you're gifted in languages, use your gift to do good. If you're gifted in finances, use your gift to do good. If you're gifted in leadership, use that gift to do good. If you're gifted in setting tables, use your gift to do good. If you're gifted in any other way, use your gift to do good. Well, in addition to ministering within the church, we are also called to be the light and the salt to our community. As the community looks at us, the church, they are to see Christ and His glory. And so that means that all Christians, the whole church, represents our Lord Jesus. And we represent Him by living a holy life, a life that He has commanded us to live. We are to faithfully evangelize the lost. And we are to point to Christ. So that means our family our occupation, or even our leisure time, whatever we do, it must be all done in accordance with what God calls good. Our efforts to do good for Christ's sake, it must be done in a joyful and a willing spirit. Don't do it as if though it's a burden to you, a task something that you hate doing, that kind of work, that kind of labor is not pleasing to the Lord. But when we do good with a willing heart, it's then that when we glorify our Lord, it's then that we then earn the reward that He will give us in eternity. He will bless us. Now look again at verse 13. Verse 13, but as for you, brethren, Paul says, do not grow weary of doing good. And notice here the fact that Paul says, as for you, he indicates here that he's shifting gears. He's changing from speaking about those whom he spoke previously in the previous section of those who are sinning by being idle to now speak of all of us in the church to encourage us to continue doing good. And he says, do not grow weary, meaning don't get tired, do not get weak, do not get discouraged. Now, it's possible that you are fulfilling God's will and you see how others are sinning in their response to your faithfulness. You're doing what the Lord has commanded you to do and people do not value what you're doing. Instead, they belittle you. They put you down. They say you should be doing something else. You know, parents, I think for us, it's easy to get discouraged and to even give up training our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord when we see that they rebel against us and they continue to do exactly what we tell them not to do. It's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to lose heart. But whatever you're doing, don't lose your enthusiasm. Don't lose your excitement and your effort to do what God called you to do. Don't look at the result. Don't look at the fact that they're not acting or it's not being received the way you hoped it would be received. Remember that you're doing what the Lord commanded you. That's all that matters. You need to be faithful to the Lord. He has gifted you for this very purpose, and therefore keep doing it. Do not grow weary. Now remember how you were when you were first converted. When you were first converted, remember how you were on fire to do the things that God commanded you to do. It's possible that people around you, your family members and friends, they 
They wondered about you. How is it that you have this strength and this energy to do all that you're doing? Well, if you have now become tired and weak, ask yourself, what happened? If you were so on fire before and so energetic, why are you weak now? The Lord hasn't changed, has He? The power of the gospel hasn't changed, has it? Then why are you tired? Are you as tired of entertaining yourself? Are you just as tired of doing the things that please you for your own pleasure? I assume not. Well, everything that we do for ourselves, it has no eternal value. It's all temporal. Well, can we not exhort our energy with the same joy for the sake of Christ that has eternal value? Can we not work and labor diligently for His sake? Perhaps you believe that you have become poorer by doing good. Don't you remember that our Lord has already made us rich with our eternal reward? You think that you're just too weak? Well, don't you remember that our Lord is the source of our strength? Pray that God will empower you to fulfill what He has commanded you to do. And then do good. Continue to do good. Beloved, for us to be a healthy church, we must not grow weary of doing good. We must not grow weary. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10 says, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. May we, as members of God's church, be faithful to fulfill the Lord's instructions. Well, in addition to doing good, in addition to fulfilling our duty, we must also practice church discipline. Look at verse 14. Chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians, verse 14, we read, If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person. For the church to take a special note of a person, it means that we are to announce that person publicly as one who is in current violation of God's will, of God's word, is to put that person under a warning before the church. Now, who must the church take special note of? Well, our text says those who do not obey the instructions that are mentioned in this letter. Apostle Paul being inspired by the Holy Spirit, is speaking God's word to believers. If a professing believer in the church, if they're not obeying what this letter states, then the church is required to mark that person. What are the instructions in this letter? So if if they're to observe the instructions of this letter, what are the instructions of this letter? Well, in the beginning of the chapter, chapter 3, we saw that we are to fulfill the command which alludes to the Lord's commission, spreading the gospel, living a holy life, and evangelizing the lost. Second, we saw that we're not to be idle. Instead, you know, if that's you, you get a job. Get a job so that you could earn your own bread. And now, in addition, we see that we're to continue to do what is good. And this command to do good, it includes obedience to the whole counsel of God. Everything that God's Word teaches. It's not good to do what God prohibits us to do. And it's also not good to not do the things that God commands us to do. So that means if someone is continuing to rebel against God's Word... Well, then we as a church, we need to take a special note of that person. Anyone, anyone who's 
flagrantly, willingly violates God's word must be dealt with. And this includes sins of gluttony, drunkenness, adultery, immorality, greed, jealousy, pride, lying, and other such things that God hates and prohibits. It also includes sins of omission, such as not doing the good things that God commanded us, like ministering, serving, evangelizing, and so on and so on. So when a member of a church is not repenting for their sin, continuing to live in rebellion, well, in such case, they must be disciplined by the church. How should the church discipline a disobedient church member? Look at verse 14. We read, take special note of that person and do not associate with him. Do not associate with him. Remember last week in verse 6, we saw Paul give the command to avoid any Christian who's not willing to work. Well, now in verse 14, he tells us to not associate with anyone who's not being obedient to God's word. This means we're not to have fellowship with them. We're not to pretend that he's in good standing with God, nor us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11, we read a similar instruction. There Paul wrote, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. Now, I do not at all mean with the moral people of the world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. A church member who is continuing in sin needs to be admonished. The church is not to allow an unrepentant sinner to have fellowship with us. We're not to allow them to pursue participate in the Lord's Supper, in the communion ordinance. The congregation must not associate with them unless they also want to be associated with their unrepented sin. In Matthew chapter 18, there Jesus gave his followers instructions on how to deal with a sinning brother. Matthew chapter 18 verse 15 It tells us that if you see a sinning brother, we're to do what? We're to go and tell him his sin in private so that nobody else knows about it. Tell him his sin in private. If he doesn't repent, then Matthew chapter 18, verse 16 tells us that we're to go with two or three more witnesses and admonish him again. And if he still doesn't repent, then in Matthew chapter 18, verse 17, it tells us to go and tell it to the church. And this is exactly what Paul is teaching us here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. The church is to note every unrepented sinner. An unrepentant sinner, an unrepentant church member, they must be marked so that they could see the seriousness of their sin. To keep the church pure. We must not allow sin to fester inside of us. Just like that tree in the beginning of my sermon that I brought up, which was caused to be weakened by the insects that were festering inside of it, we too must not allow sin to go unchecked. Or else we too will weaken and we will also fall. We're all accountable to God. And hence, we must keep each other accountable Well, why is a sinning church member to be noted by the church? Look at the end of verse 14. Paul says, so that he will be put to shame. The pressure of isolation, it's meant to bring about shame. The verb shame in the Greek, it literally has the sense to turn in on oneself And so to be ashamed is to be 
disappointed in yourself. It's to be feeling that you've displeased the Lord, that you've caused others to shun you. In Greco-Roman culture, shame was a powerful tool. It was used for motivation to change a person's behavior. Christians in Thessalonica, think about this, they were already ostracized, they were already avoided by their community because they turned from idols to now serve the true and living God. But now, those who were disciplined by the church because they're, unrepent, they're not repenting for their sin, they're now further removed from having fellowship. Shame for not living according to God's word. It needs to cause a true believer to reflect on their own condition, to see themselves for their wickedness. You see, church discipline is meant to draw a believer to repentance. Repentance and restoration are always the goal, the goal of church discipline. Now look at verse 15. Verse 15, yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Here we see two things, grace and firmness. Grace and firmness. If the sinning brother claims to be a believer, then Scripture says we're not to regard him as as our enemy. We're not to mock him for his sin. We're not to call him names. Instead, we're to graciously tell him why we are avoiding him. First Thessalonians chapter 5, it instructed us to be patient with the unruly. And so, the principle here is to be gracious. Show them grace. But also, we are to admonish him as a brother. Admonish him as a brother. And the word admonish here is in the present continual state, which means to continue to admonish him. We're to counsel, instruct, continue to warn him as a believer, as a fellow brother. We must admonish all unrepented sinners, unrepentant sinners, because we seek their own good. We want them to repent. We want the church to remain pure and not allow others to be tempted to act similarly. Well, how should we admonish our brother? What kind of attitude should we have? Well, in a proper family, you know, brothers, they love each other. Therefore, they can point each other's mistakes. So if my brother shows me what I did wrong, I will listen to him because I know that he's not doing this because he hates me. He's doing this because he loves me. He wants to help me out so that I don't repeat the same mistake. Well, in the same way, we Christians, we are family. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2 states, Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. So we're to admonish our sinning brothers by gently bringing God's word to bear on their situation. God's word, it provides the instruction in how to keep the church pure. It convicts a person of sin, shows them what they did wrong, and how to please the Lord. We must practice church discipline so that we could draw the disobedient believer to repentance. We must love him as a brother, but we are also to let him know that his unrepentant sin, it grieves us, causes causes us grief. And if the disobedient brother repents, Well, then the church is to declare that the sin that that brother had, it has been dealt with. We're now to receive him back into fellowship. And if the sinning brother does not repent, continues to live in disobedience, well, then Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 18, verse 17, 
that we are to excommunicate him out of the congregation and consider him as an unbeliever. This is why church membership is so important. It makes all of us accountable, not only to God, but it makes us accountable to each other. And so far we saw that the church is to fulfill its duty. The church is to practice discipline. Now let's see how we're to also have delight in the Lord. So as Paul signs off, he prays in verse 16, Now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The church in Thessalonica had been disturbed. They needed peace. Look, they were persecuted for their faith. They were also disturbed by some false teachers who came and said, the rapture has already occurred, and now you are experiencing the wrath of God. And they're now beginning also to experience uh, disorderly members within the congregations who are idle and who are not being obedient to God's word. They needed to, be, they needed to have peace. And every church needs to have peace in order for us to have delight in the Lord. But the question comes up, how can we have peace? You can have peace when God grants it to us from above. And that's why Paul prays that the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace. You see, our Lord, he's the master of peace. Isaiah 9, 6 reveals that he's the prince of peace. It is his very essence. It is his nature. It is one of his divine attributes. Our God is always, he's always at perfect peace. There's never disagreement within, it, within the Trinity. He's never under stress. He's never worried. He's never anxious, fearful, or uncertain of any circumstance. No, he's always perfectly calm, content, because he's sovereign. Even his wrath, it is controlled and confident. The Lord Jesus alone can give us this real peace. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus told his followers, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You see, the, the peace that Jesus brought, it differs from that peace that the world can offer to you. The world can offer you temporary relief by calming your nerves with either promises of some kind of security or by causing you to be in a state of stupor through some chemical substance that changes the activity of your brain. That's what the world changes. Uh, that's the, what the world can offer you as peace. Jesus, on the other hand, he has brought everlasting, real peace that we now have, first of all, with God our Father. We used to be enemies, but now he has reconciled us to him. Also peace amongst each other, those who are Believers, they belong to Christ, and therefore we're brothers and sisters. We can have peace with one another. And also, ultimately, we can have inner peace, knowing that God is in control of every situation. You know, this past Friday, we had our Bible study, and in, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, we saw that Jesus brought peace to us through the blood of his cross. The elements that we have in front of us they testify to how the Lord brought us peace. In John chapter 20, verse 19, Jesus there, he appears to his distressed disciples right after his death, burial, and resurrection. The disciples were not sure what was going on. He appears to them and he says, I bring you peace. He granted them peace. A healthy church can delight in the Lord because we have been granted peace. Now, there could be someone here who's a professing believer, 
and who's not experiencing the Lord's peace today. If that's you, can I ask you some questions? Do you believe that the Lord loved you from before the foundation of the world? Do you believe that those whom he loved, he'll never leave nor forsake? Do you understand how God predestined your eternal purpose? How he orchestrates everything in your life with his sovereign power? Do you know how he guarantees your salvation for the glory of his grace? Does that not make an impact in your life? If you lack peace, you need to turn to the Lord of peace. He delights to graciously give peace to those who belong to him. In verse 16 we read, Paul prayed that the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. Every circumstance. And to have peace in every circumstance, it means to have it through all that you are going through. All that happens to you right now, good or bad, you could have this peace. You could be lying in a hospital and you could say, Lord, do as you will with me. You could have peace knowing that the Lord will, has everything in control and that if He wills for you to get better, well, then you're blessed. And if He doesn't, then you're still blessed. If your life is spared, then you have eternal peace with the Lord. And if the Lord takes you home to be in His glorious kingdom, then you still have peace because of His sacrifice for you. We can have peace all the time. Whatever comes our way, He grants us this continual, this unbroken peace. If our Lord already grants believers His eternal peace, then why does Paul pray for the Lord to grant the church peace? Well, because even though the Lord gives us this true peace and it's always available for us, We as Christians, we can forfeit it. We can neglect it. You see, weak or disobedient Christians, they might find themselves at moments lacking peace. How does this happen? Well, they could lack peace when they distrust that Christ is causing all things to work together for their own good. Or when they commit some other sin and they break that sweet fellowship with the Lord. In Psalm 42 verse 11, the psalmist there asked himself, Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him. You see, peace that's forfeited by sin, it can be restored through repentance and obedience. Well, what if you're not a believer? If you're not a believer then you can't even experience this true spiritual peace. That's not even available for you. Neither your hope, effort, or anything else can bring you this glorious peace. Today, believe in the Lord Jesus, that He is your Lord and Savior, who came to this earth, lived a perfect life, took upon Himself your sins, that He was crucified and bled on the cross, that he died, was buried, then resurrected and ascended into heaven to provide eternal peace to you. If you believe in him as Lord and Savior, in your heart, then you too can have this eternal glorious peace. But for you, believer, you already have it. It's already available for you. Why? Look at the end of verse 16. End of verse 16, Paul says, The Lord be with you all. Now, this is not a wish. This is not a possibility. No, this is a statement. This is a reminder. What is he reminding? Matthew 28, verse 20, where Jesus promised his followers before he ascended into heaven. He said, And lo, I am with you always. Always. And even to the end of the age. Jesus, our Lord, is God. 
and he's always with us. The church, we must delight in the Lord because he has granted us peace. So regardless of our circumstance, we can experience confidence. We can experience this unshakable joy in any storm that comes our way. Well, a healthy church also delights in the Lord because we have confidence in the inspiration and the authority of Scripture. Apostle Paul, he was an ambassador of Christ. He was used by God to write God's Word. The Holy Spirit used Paul's style, uh, his intellect, and he panned God's exact words to us. And in verse 17 here, we see Paul say, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, and this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. And when Paul wrote his letters, his epistles, uh, he usually had a scribe who would pan his exact words. Today it's popular for people to use um, voice text where they speak and then the phone, their smartphone, it actually writes the text for them. Well, you better check your text before you send it because sometimes the phone misspells things and changes the meaning completely of what you wanted to say. So you better check before you send it. Well, Paul had a better way of typing. He had a living scribe who didn't make any mistakes. Who was Paul's scribe? Well, I believe that this letter was penned by Silvanus. How do I know that, or why do I think that Silvanus penned this letter? Well, first of all, Paul often says through 1st and 2nd Thessalonians that Silvanus and Timothy are with him. Keeps reminding that Silvanus and Timothy, and he uses the plural form we and us. We also know that Silvanus was indeed a scribe who wrote Peter's epistle. In 1st Peter chapter 5, uh, today the young adults will be finishing chapter 5 of 1 Peter, and there Peter concludes, he says, Through Silvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. So therefore, I believe that Silvanus panned Paul's words here. But in conclusion of the letter, Paul takes the pen from his scribe and he writes his final greeting to give it authenticity. He says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. And then furthermore, he leaves a distinguishing mark for the church to know that this epistle is indeed authoritative, that this is indeed the word of God. Now, what was this mark? Some believe that he drew some special sign, some kind of figure at the end of his letter, which got lost in the translations or copies, and so therefore we don't have it in our Bibles any longer. However, if you look closer at our text, you'll see that he's referring to the way I write, he says, to the way I write. So it's not what I draw or write, it's how I write. This means that his distinguishing mark is his handwriting style. This is the way I write. This is my mark. Now, what was so significant about Paul's handwriting? I think Galatians chapter 6, verse 11 gives us insight. Paul there concludes the letter of Galatians saying, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. In the same letter, Paul, he talks about how the Galatians were willing to rip their own eyes out and give it to Paul. Paul's eyesight was never the same after the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus. It was never the same. Probably, this is the reason that he had to use a scribe. Remember, Paul was very educated. He was very well read, knew many languages, but he uses a scribe in all his letters. So he had to now write with big letters to see what he was writing. And why was it important for Paul to authenticate his letter? Well, there were false teachers, false um, 
ministers who were writing all sorts of letters to the churches which were not inspired by God. Some could have attempted to forge letters as though they're from Paul, but the church, but the church, they could delight that what they had here in 2 Thessalonians, this indeed was from Paul. They had his handwriting. Finally, look at verse 18. Paul concludes encouraging the church with, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Paul often concludes his letters with a blessing by praying that the church would experience the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, This word grace, it's referring to God's undeserved goodness and favor. His grace to those who are unworthy. Salvation is not granted to us because We justly deserved it. If we were to receive what we deserve, we we would all be destroyed in hell. But Christians are redeemed because of Christ's grace towards us. Grace is essential for us believers, not only for our salvation, but also for our spiritual growth, for our endurance, for our ministry, for our service. We can delight in the Lord because He's always with us and His grace abounds to us. So we must continue to live in His grace. How? By trusting Him, obeying His word, enduring His discipline, doing good, walking in the Spirit, praying. There's nothing in God's plans or purposes that's intended to harm us. Must remember that God has a purpose for everything that he allows to happen to us. Therefore, we can have delight in the Lord. Well, what a wonderful epistle. The church can and must strive for purity. We must be pleasing to the Lord. And we do need the Lord's empowerment to do this. But, beloved, we've been reminded twice today in verse 16 and verse 18 that the Lord is always with us. The Lord is always with us. He strengthens us and enables us to do His will, to be pleasing to Him. So for our applications, how do we apply this text to our life? Well, first of all, we must continue to do good. There will be glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good. We must also practice church discipline. We must note unrepented sinners so that we can draw them back to repentance. We must discourage others from doing the same acts, the same sins. We must protect our church from rotting from the inside out. And if you don't do this, if you don't practice church discipline, then we will surely fall, just like that great tree in the park fell when the storm came. Well, in addition, we must also delight in the Lord, delight in His peace that He has granted to us, delight in His Word, the authority of Scripture, delight in the grace that He has given to us abundantly. We've been united to Christ, and we will share his glory and his kingdom. Beloved, we're going to pray right now, and then we're going to celebrate the Lord's table. We'll first sing a hymn, and then we'll celebrate the Lord's table. If you're able and willing, would you please rise for prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, that it's sharper than any two-edged sword, And we thank you for both of the letters to the Thessalonians. What a journey we had going through verse by verse, seeing how these instructions were not only applicable to the Thessalonians in their context, but how they are applicable and relevant to us in our context. We thank you, Lord, for the way you have ordained for us to have the manual, to have the the, the instructions that we need in order to to live the life that pleases you. 
And so, Lord, we pray that all of us would indeed do good, that we would understand the purpose and the necessity of church discipline, and that we would rejoice and have peace in you, knowing the grace that you have shown us. Lord, strengthen us. I pray that you would cleanse us from our sins, that you would give us joy of our salvation. May we rejoice that you have accomplished everything for us, and may we live a life that's pleasing to you. Pray that our church would indeed be pure. Pray these things in Christ's name, amen.
despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. The hand that healed nations stretched out on a tree and took the nails for me. receive this benediction. <clears throat> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. Have a wonderful week. I'll bless you.